Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Boston Scientific stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Boston Scientific was formed in 1979 in Massachusetts and they went public in 1992. It is a manufacturer of medical devices used in radiology, cardiology, cardiac surgery, vascular surgery, endoscopy, oncology, urology, gynecology, and much more. The company is primarily known for the development of the Taxis stent. This is a drug eluding stent which is used to open clogged arteries. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company. 50 billion market cap, they're trading at 35.55 a share and they have 1.4 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has positive free cash flow except in 2019 they had negative. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And they have lots of net income in 2019 in a trailing 12 months. It's pretty low in 2017. Revenue is a sales for the company and that seems to be growing. It goes from 9 billion to 10.7 billion, then slips a little in a trailing 12 months. Also, their net profit margins are improving a lot. It's as little as 1% up to 36%, and it was 44% at its max in 2019. Net profit margin is net income divided by revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. They converted 44% of their revenue into profit in 2019. That means 56% went towards expenses. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue and revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit and that was lower in a trailing 12 months when compared to 2019 and 2018. Below that is the operating expenses and then below that is operating income and their operating income was below $1 billion. It was almost half of what it was in 2019. The company also has a decent amount of debt so they have interest payments on their debt. And then there's other income and expenses, which are income and expenses that are not directly tied to a company's core operations. This usually includes investments and impairments. According to the company's 10K, their tax rate in 2019 was negative 584%. A deferred tax asset is a non-cash item, so we have to add back the $4 billion on a statement of cash flows. So this is $4 billion of tax benefit from its intellectual property rights. In 2019, the company had about $700 million of pre-tax income, yet it reported $4.7 billion of income. If I was analyzing this company, I would focus more on the $700 million than the $4.7 billion. Because this $4 billion tax credit isn't applicable to their core operations, they did not earn that money through their regular business of selling medical devices. This may be a little confusing, so let me know in the comments if you want to talk about it further. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generated from its operational business. And then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. To calculate free cash flow, it's operating cash flow minus CapEx. So they had over $1.1 billion in the trailing 12 months. That's down from $1.4 billion in 2019. But they did report negative in 2018. The company does issue a lot of debt to fund their business. They issued $3.3 billion in 2017, but paid off $3.2 billion. So that's kind of a wash. In 2018, they issued about $1.4 billion more than they paid off. In 2019, they issued $2.8 billion more of debt. In the trailing 12 months, they paid $2 billion more of debt than they paid off, but they issued $2 billion of capital stock to fund that debt. The most important part of any business is the operational cash flow because if you don't have positive and healthy operating cash flow, you don't have much of a business because you cannot rely on debt and equity financing to fund your business in the long term. So you can see Yahoo Finance lists the operating cash flow for the trailing 12 months of $1.5 billion, but the other information is blank, so we can just look at 2019. So in 2019, they had net income of $4.7 billion. But remember, they had a $4.3 billion tax benefit. 
So we have to subtract that out on a statement of cash flows. They also pass through a $1 billion depreciation expense, so we have to add that back to the statement of cash flows. So they actually operated $1.8 billion of cash flows in 2019. And they did mention sales are a little lower due to COVID, so they're operating with a little less cash flow. Let's look at a capital structure. They have $14 billion of equity, $10 billion of debt, and 57% of the capital structure is equity, 43% is debt and their WAC is 8.14%, which is a blend of the cost of equity and cost of debt. And that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 46 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $41 billion. We divide that by 1.4 billion shares. We get a calculated stock price of $29. They're trading at $36, so they're trading at a 21% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply, Wall Street is in the other direction. They're saying the stock is worth $43. I did grow the company's future cash flows more than they've been reporting in the past few years. The reason I did that was based off of the company's estimates of their future revenue and free cash flow. Apparently, Simply, Wall Street's growth is even more aggressive than me. From 2015 to March of 2020, the stock was increasing little by little. Then it dropped a lot when the market crashed. It has come up, but it seems like it's been slipping the past couple of weeks. The stock is trading at a discount relative to its all-time high. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd have $46,000 today. That's a pretty good return on investment. The company has a pretty low beta, 0.86, so the stock moves less than a market. The stock is down 22% in the past 52 weeks. The S&P 500 is up 14.5%. The 52-week low was $24. The high was $46. The stock is trading above its 50-day moving average, but below its 200-day moving average. When the 200-day moving average crosses above the 50-day moving average, that's called the death cross. That's a bearish signal. And this is a fairly liquid stock. 7 to 13 million shares are traded each day. It seems like all the shares outstanding are on float. And almost 95% of the shares are held by institutions, so they're pretty bullish on this stock. And only 1.16% of the shares are shorted. BlackRock owns 9% of the stock, then Vanguard at 8%, then State Street, Capital Research, and FMR. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average P.E. in the market is 12. The median is 14.7. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 13.7, so they're between the average and median. 13.7 means investors are paying $13.70 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 5.0, so they're between the median and average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 3.6, so they're also between the median and average. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities on the balance sheet, and they have $14 billion of equity, but they have negative $4.2 billion of tangible equity. That means they have a lot of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense, so they can cover their interest payments two times. ROE is net income over equity. They have a really good ROE. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities, so they can almost cover their current liabilities. And their current assets are $217 million of cash, $2 billion of receivables, and $1.6 billion of inventory. The company seems to have enough cash flow to get through the next 12 months without needing any more debt. Their free cash flow in the trailing 12 months was $1.1 billion, but they have negative $167 million of working capital. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Abbott Labs, Align, and Viamed, all in the same industry as Boston Scientific. And if BSX has a number in green, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they're better in all the price multiples. They're a little low in current ratio, below the average. They do have a good ROE, but it's much lower than the average in the industry. They have the most debt of all the companies, and they're a big company, 50 billion market cap, but a lot smaller than Abbott Labs, and they don't pay a dividend. So to summarize, I do have them trading at a 21% premium, but this company manufactures really important medical products. So this should be a really good stock to hold for long term. And there's so much money that goes in and out of the medical industry, and BSX seems to be positioned really well for that. So let me know what you think. 
Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking in the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.